they use kind of you writing songs about your life as a way to play detective. Music has always spoken to us, but more and more music feels like it's speaking to someone else. Recent years have seen a significant rise in songs that seem to be about the particular people and problems in singers' lives rather than soundtracking our own. Did Taylor Swift write Bad Blood about Katy Perry? As you all know, the song itself is about Taylor's long-standing feud with Katy Perry. Did Katy Perry fire back with Swish Swish? Amateur sleuths scoured Beyonce's lemonade for clues about her husband Jay-Z's infidelity, while Ariana Grande's Thank You Next was far less subtle about name-checking her ex-boyfriends. So while artists have long written about themselves and the people they know, more than ever today's pop music feels rife with messages for fans to decode, requiring the casual listener to do the research to figure out why Drake is beefing with Meek Mill, Kanye West, or Pusha T. This is a sport at the end of the day, and you know from a very early point, I've never shied away from defending myself. Mm -hmm. Buoyed by stan culture and aided by sites like Genius that annotate and dissect the subtext of lyrics. Man, I met Shorty at Olive Garden, right? She was living in a basement with her mama. I should have left your ass at Olive Garden, man. We've become increasingly used to approaching music as part of an overarching tabloid-esque narrative that's advanced with every new single and cryptic illusion. And then that song came out and my friends were like, bro, I love you, I love you, right? <laughs> is catchy. But shorn of their gossipy contexts, do these songs stand on their own? Here's our take on how we came to care so much about the stories behind the songs, and whether music that asks us to do supplemental reading robs it of something essential. We don't have time to get into the backstory. Google it, people. Hi, everyone. I'm Susanna. And I'm Deborah. And you're watching The, the take. take. Be sure to share and subscribe. And never miss a take. This video is brought to you by Raycon, a line of premium wireless headphones and earbuds at affordable prices. Raycons not only offer amazing sound quality, but they're also water resistant, Bluetooth enabled, and have a 24 hour battery life. So click the link in the description below, buyraycon.com slash the take to save 15% on your first Raycon order today. In 1972, Carly Simon set rumors swirling with one sly lyric. As her single hit number one, it seemed like everyone wanted to know who's so vain. Could this enigmatic character she describes with the apricot scarf and the hat strategically dipped below one eye be her ex-lover Warren Beatty? Simon later admitted that at least the second verse is about Beatty. But she teased the real story across nearly five decades worth of interviews. The mystery has become as important as the song itself. The song You're So Vain was in fact written by me. Simon released You're So Vain amid the heyday of the confessional song. Fleetwood Mac's 1977 album Rumors turned the band members' various romantic dramas with each other into searingly personal songs full of palpable anger and heartbreak. I've always been a firm believer that much of the appeal of Rumors uh, went beyond the music itself. The following year, Marvin Gaye's Here My Dear laid bare his acrimony over his divorce from his first wife. Why do I have to pay alternatives? 1970s albums were filled with singers singing about other singers. There's a line in that song, I don't mean to suggest that I loved you the best. And that specifically meant that uh, I wasn't one of Janis Joplin's closest friends. Audiences didn't always want to be let in on the secret. The earliest, most successful pop stars like Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby, or Perry Como cut their teeth on jazz standards, show tunes, and the Great American Songbook. Elvis Presley, intensely beloved by fans, still performed songs written by someone else. He was an actor, starring in whatever story that particular song was trying to tell. But all of this changed with the arrival of two groundbreaking artists. He's gorgeous! He's gorgeous! He's got a beautiful nose! He's got a beautiful nose! Ringo! Ringo has a sexy nose! The Beatles became famous not just as a rock band, but as a group of distinct personalities. Paul McCartney being the cute one, John being the smart one, George being the quiet one, or Ringo Starr being the funny one, was reinforced across films and cartoons, which turned them into only slightly exaggerated characters, allowing fans to feel like they really knew these guys. 
I'll always love him. Even when I'm 105 and an old grandmother, I'll love him. And Paul McCartney, if you are listening, Adrian from Brooklyn loves you with all her heart. At the same time, the Beatles songs and albums were peppered with personal pronouns. Titles like Meet the Beatles, I Want to Hold Your Hand, and Do You Want to Know a Secret made it seem as though they were reaching out to you. As a result, fans became intimately invested in the Beatles' personal lives, turning up to weep openly at their weddings. Well, what is upset you that he's getting married? Why is I'm not happy. By the end of the decade, they were singing along with John Lennon as he complained about being hounded by the press on his honeymoon. Meanwhile, as Bob Dylan's protest music got him heralded as the voice of a generation, he drew on details torn from real-life events. This is taken out of the newspaper. Nothing but the words have been changed. For many, Dylan was the truth, which led to people looking for verisimilitude in all his music. Critics combed through his lyrics, seeking hints about the real-life Mr. Jones in Ballad of a Thin Man or the Miss Lonely at the center of Like a Rolling Stone. Songs like Positively Fourth Street were bitter, first-person kiss-offs that definitely seemed directed at someone, like the Greenwich Village folk crowds who turned their back on him for going electric, as many speculated. I know the reason that you talk behind my back. Like the Beatles, Bob Dylan was a hero to his fans, who hung on his every enigmatic word. Your songs are supposed to have a subtle <coughs> message. A subtle message? <laughs> well, they're supposed to. <laughs> Where'd you hear that? Dylan helped to foster the importance of authenticity in pop music. This watchword had long been a manifesto of sorts in the folk and country scenes, embodied by Dylan's own hero, freight train hopping troubadour Woody Guthrie. And in the wake of Dylan's rise, audiences increasingly gravitated toward artists who seemed true. Singer-songwriters like Carole King, who began her career writing popular songs for others, were no longer writing tunes for the perfect voices and idealized images of pop stars past, but singing themselves, about themselves. The one thing I can do that nobody else can do as the songwriter is deliver the songwriter's version of that song. It's just as close to the source as you can get. That sort of raw, intimately personal songwriting endures today in modern folk artists like Phoebe Bridgers, Julian Baker, and Bonnie Vare. It's about people's first love, for instance, like mine, and how I never got over it. But the soul-bearing confessional has increasingly wound its way into other genres. This song, I think, is just really important um, because it talks about me personally going through something very hard. Hip-hop in particular has owned and perfected the idea of the confessional song. Hip-hop songs are almost always told from a first-person perspective, with artists often delving into the details of their real lives, no matter how dark or uncomfortable. Oh, what's the matter, Kim? Am I too loud for you? Like with Dylan or Woody Guthrie, rappers' identities are intrinsically tied to their authenticity, often conveyed through narratives of hardships they've overcome. We used to fuss when the landlord dissed us, no heat, wonder why Christmas missed us. And these confessions create an intimate bond between artist and audience that engenders their trust and their loyalty. They've said things like, yo, your music has saved my life. While artists like Bob Dylan and Carly Simon were purposefully cryptic in their insults, others have been more direct, using their songs to openly call people out by name and start beefs with other artists. Examples of the diss track exist across genres. Well, I hope you young will remember. But as with the confessional, hip hop all but owns the diss track, ever since 1981's legendary face off between Cool Mo D and Busy B. So I said, I can't believe he didn't acknowledge that he couldn't beat me in a battle. So I go up to the guy that's, that's in, in Harlem World to put my name on the list. He said, you getting in the battle? I said, yeah. I said, and put me on right after Busy B. The battle rap, largely consisting of anything goes insults, remains foundational to the very idea of hip hop, with rappers typically squaring off over not only who's the most talented, but also who's the realest. So again, authenticity is key. But I know something about you. You went to Cranbrook, that's a private school. <laughs> Hip-hop's first rivalry, The Bridge Wars, saw MC Shan and Boogie Down Productions locked in a dispute over which New York neighborhood actually started hip-hop. So you think that hip-hop had its start out in Queensbridge? 
And as hip-hop expanded from East Coast to West, intense regional loyalties and beef became crucial to the genre's explosion. Beef is when I see you. Guaranteed to be in I see you. The most famous rap beef between East Coast rapper The Notorious B.I.G. and West Coast rapper Tupac Shakur grew out of tragedy. The 1994 near-fatal shooting of Tupac at Quad Studios, which he suspected Biggie, who was also in the building, of being involved in. But it was also out of a lyrical misunderstanding. Tupac was convinced that Biggie's track Who Shot You was directed at him, even though Biggie and his associates insisted it was not about Tupac and written before the Quad incident. We have no reason, no motive at all to have set Pac up. But Tupac couldn't be sure. The East Coast, West Coast feud consumed hip hop, fed by Tupac tracks like Hit 'em Up and figures who profited from it being good business, like death row label head Suge Knight. Come to death row. And even in the wake of both Biggie's and Tupac's devastating murders, beefs remained an integral part of the genre, from Jay-Z vs. Nas to 50 Cent vs. Ja Rule to Drake vs. well, almost everybody. While hip-hop is no longer strictly divided along the coastlines, the call to action remains the same for fans. Pick a side and stay loyal to your team. We f Joe Budden up more than Drake's diss track did to him. The sense of tribalism this creates is powerful. It's also innate. In his social identity theory, psychologist Henri Tajfel theorized that people instinctively split the world into in-groups and out-groups, us versus them, while using negative aspects of the other to enhance their own self-image. Are you Team Taylor or Team Kim? Music beefs foster loyalty because they help fans cement their own identities. Music is identity. Every belief, ideology, you ever come up with or anything you're passionate about tends to link with the music you listen to. And for the parties involved, they make good business sense. Beefs increase brand awareness, lifting relatively obscure artists into the limelight and keeping major artists' names in the headlines even when they don't have anything new to promote. Silly rap beefs just give me more checks. Meanwhile, every rapper that Kendrick Lamar called out during his verse on Big Sean's Control. Big Sean, Jay Electron, Tyler Mac Miller, I got love for you all, but I'm trying to murder you. Went on to experience career best sales. Some argue that the creative one-upmanship of beefs has been key to the history of hip hop's success. But there are also obvious downsides to the musical beef and its culture of war that has sometimes spilled over into brutal real life violence. It made rap music look bad. It made rap music look like it's just another part of the dope game. In rap in particular, the threats made in lyrics have actually been used to prosecute artists. And our cultural fascination with the diva feud, which is shamelessly exploited by the media, is based in an underlying misogyny. As ID's Andre Naquan Wheeler writes, it reinforces the idea that only one woman can own a piece of a pie in a very male-dominated industry, forcing them to compete with each other in unfair ways. Artistically, too, the beef can rob music of its inherent significance. It reduces music to a branding message, part of an external narrative that turns our musical heroes into something more like professional wrestlers. I never f Wayne, I never f Drake. It also forces the fan to stay on top of all the artists' shifting loyalties just to understand what they're singing about. The feud between Biggie and Tupac may have been relatively clear-cut, but understanding why Tupac also once took a shot at the Fugees requires untangling a complex narrative involving Tupac's acting career, his sexual assault charges, and a shadowy music exec named Haitian Jack. Pac also called out Haitian Jack on Against All Odds. Pac believed Haitian Jack set him up and was a major reason why he ended up taking the sex abuse charges in the first place. It's a lot to ask of a fan. Taking sides often means taking pains to keep up. Fan relationships in the context of musical acts is much stronger. You know, every time we listen to that song, the reward center of our brain is like stimulated. Fans have been replaced by stans, the kind of overzealous, obsessive follower that Eminem introduced in his 2000 song of the same name. My girlfriend's jealous because I talk about you 24 7, but she don't know you like I know you slim. No one does. Stands are a veritable army dedicated to discussing, defending, and even attacking on behalf of their leader. They gave themselves that. Mm -hmm. I um, 
I originally was calling them the Ariana Army, and then I was calling them tiny elephants. I don't know how that came about. The obsessiveness, when combined with the intimacy of confessional songwriting and the tribalism of musical beefs, has greatly affected the way music is received. Beyonce's seminal genre-hopping visual album Lemonade is a multi-layered work about grief, femininity, and black identity. But on its release, fans and critics alike seemed far more interested in what it revealed about the tabloid scandal in Beyonce's personal life. You better call Becky with the good hair. And when fashion designer Rachel Roy posted a photo to Instagram with the caption, Good hair don't care, the beehive swarmed Roy's account, vandalizing her Wikipedia page, and even accidentally going after celebrity chef Rachel Ray in confusion. Some artists seem to encourage this behavior. Taylor Swift has made an art of peppering her videos with allusions to the various people in her orbit, giving her fans plenty of alleys to run down. Almost every album you have a song where you address the haters. At least one song, sometimes I probably more than do one have song. that habit. I imagine that I might have that habit, yeah. Publicly embracing and making art out of her feuds with Katy Perry on Bad Blood or with Kanye West on her album Reputation has been seen as evidence of her maturing, outgrowing her squeaky clean image, and owning her narrative. The old Taylor can't come to the phone right now. Why? Because she's dead. But it also makes all of her music part of that narrative. She just kind of swears that the drama is attracted to her. And despite her being the kind of person who would take legal action against Etsy users selling Taylor Swift crafts. There is definitely a gender bias at play here. Women in music, like female creators in general, have complained for years about their work being read as autobiographical automatically, in a way that never happens with men. Annie Clark, better known as St. Vincent, told ID, I believe it's a subtle kind of sexism where people just assume that women are more emotional or more intuitive and they can only write about their emotions instead of ideas. And while Taylor Swift may consciously incorporate her personal life into her music, she's also been a victim of the inaccurate and misogynist criticism that this is all she writes about. She just writes songs about her ex-boyfriends, and I think, frankly, that's a very sexist angle to take. No one says that about Ed Sheeran. No yeah, one says right. it about Bruno Mars. They're all writing songs about their exes. Not only is this assumption limiting for the artist, it's limiting for the art. Songs cease to be standalone works of music and instead are treated as something akin to an expanding cinematic universe. IndieWire has argued that millennials are actively keen on long-form narrative thanks to being raised on bingeable TV shows and 50-hour video games. But this approach is also about constantly consuming the newest episode, then quickly forgetting it and moving on to the next chapter. Music benefits from being lived with. While today's artists may have more dedicated, more involved bands than ever before, the tendency to look at songs as a conversation means those listeners might miss the bigger picture of what the music is really saying. How much of this was I thinking about when I wrote the song? None of it. How much of it was I feeling when I wrote the song? All of it. By focusing on the autobiographical, we are in danger of missing the universal. The way songs capture feelings in a way that relates to our lives, not the artists. You're So Vain still resonates all these years later, not because the listener enjoys the sick burn on Warren Beatty, but because it reminds them of their own ex-lover. You may have never been called out by the Greenwich folk scene, but when Bob Dylan sings, you you think of your own betrayals. Playing into the current cultural narrative and generating viral speculation and online discussion can be key to a modern song's success. But music that's too tied to a moment can easily be rendered disposable, unlikely to retain its power as the years go by. Feuds are forgotten and beefs are healed. It's hard to listen to those songs now, cause, cause we cool, you know. I love Dre and Ren and Easy and Yella. Yeah, you know them, my guys. When music relies too much on us to do the reading, we don't do enough listening, and that's where we learn that, with apologies to Carly Simon, the song isn't about you. It's about us. I just want people to listen to it and have their own experience with it. This is the take. What do you want our take on next? This video is brought to you by Raycon, a line of stylish wireless earbuds that start at half the price of any other premium wireless earbuds on the market. 
Raycons come in a range of fun colors and patterns, plus they're super comfortable. Because no two ears are exactly alike, there are a variety of fit options. Raycons are perfect for working from home, working out, and listening to music and podcasts for hours on end. Their everyday E25 earbuds are their best model yet, with six hours of playtime, seamless Bluetooth pairing, and a compact design that delivers a noise-isolating fit. So click the link in the description below, buyraycon.com slash the take, to get 15% off your first order today.